<laughs> We're good, I see it. All right, good to go. All right, so welcome to Florida and to uh, the money show. Um, I'm gonna talk to you about a whole bunch of things. I wanna start with just a bit of bad news, which is that there's been a shocking number of things that you know nothing about. Now, here's the good news. The good news is that tomorrow it'll be a different group of things, so you don't really have to worry, because what's going on is change. Every industry, every business is being changed. And honestly, people don't change because they get hit on the head with an apple or because lightning strikes. They change because they feel the heat. But what I'll tell you is that change isn't hard. What's hard is overcoming the resistance to change. What worked for us really well for decades and for in every part of our life. And so one of the problems is the greatest obstacle these days to success and to change is frankly success because we're lazy. And if it's working, we don't want to change it. But honestly, today, if you're not a little bit worried, if you're not a little bit on edge about what's going to happen in the future, you don't really understand what's going on. And if you want to take a minute to check this out, look on your BlackBerry, and you'll see that, uh, or, or swing by Sears and see how things are going for Sears. So the, look, the idea of all of this is that the markets have changed radically. The folks that used to be the market leaders, different group entirely. Uh, the only th question about this chart, honestly, is what's Microsoft still doing up there? Okay, Microsoft missed everything. They missed the web. They missed mobile. They missed search unless you binged anything lately. And so, so what is the story with Microsoft? Well, inertia in part, because they're still installed on more than 90% of the desktops in the world, but also they've been really clever about diversification. And this is significant. The big tech leaders are pretty much one trick ponies except for Amazon and Microsoft. And they've really diversified what's going on. The other thing that Microsoft has done that's made it more valuable than Apple is really three steps. The first thing was they are moving very aggressively to the cloud, and that's been significant. Second, when they made a mistake on the phone whole initiative, they cut their losses, and that was a big thing. And then the third thing is they're buying their way into the markets that make sense. So they've acquired LinkedIn, they acquired GitHub. Honestly, we'll see how these work out for them, and the reason I say that is that they acquired Skype like 10 or 15 years ago, and they haven't done much of anything. But today, the message is really simple. The message is whatever industry you're in, if you don't change, you die. You know, BMW calls these things the ultimate driving machine. The truth is they're the ultimate parking machine. 95% of the time, our cars are not used. So we're seeing all kinds of new solutions. We're seeing apartment buildings on the West Coast that include a car with your apartment. There'll be always a few clean cars in the garage. You can use them when you need them. Nobody wants to own anything. We're seeing a whole new set of models around subscriptions. You can subscribe for a car, and it's not just Volvo. It's basically all of the players now are saying, you want a Cadillac this week? You want a Porsche next week? Uh, GM has services like this. Uh, and look at how appealing this is. You heard about uh, the slander of millennials. Honestly, how appealing is it to have somebody say, this car that you can have whenever you need it by the hour, no gas issues, no insurance issues. So when I spoke a couple of weeks ago in Detroit for the automotive show, and by the way, this is the last automotive show after 30 years, the last international auto show in Detroit, they don't even call themselves automotive companies anymore. They're interested in mobility, it turns out. And so that's what's going on in the future of cars. We're going to have about 50% of the cars will be gray cars, which means they'll be in service about 50% of the time, but they'll be doing short haul things. They'll be part of the shared ride economy. And then we'll still have those cars that are sort of an expression of our personalities and what we're interested in. But auto is going to change radically. Hospitality is going to change radically. You all have heard probably of you know Airbnb, but it's hard to understand the scale of this change. So right now, Airbnb is a powerful tool. It's probably the best singly established of the tech companies because it has international demand and international supply. But what's really significant is within the next six months, Airbnb will be the back door for most of the hotels in America. 
because the hotels have figured out something that the airlines figured out a while ago, and that is you don't want to be empty. So if it's the middle of the day and you have a bunch of rooms that are empty, you don't really care what you are paid per room. You just don't want to have empty seats. You don't want to have empty rooms any more than the airlines do. And so that's what's going to happen to that industry. That's the first half. That's the OK part. The part that's frightening is that you have these three market leaders, and look at the headcount. Look at the fact that the two big guys have almost 400,000 employees. And what does Airbnb have? Roughly equivalent in market cap, 3,500 employees. What are we going to do with the hundreds of thousands of people that aren't going to have jobs in the near future? This is the kind of disruption and change that's going on. And this future is not like in a year or 10. The future is right now. And the future is across everything. We've got the Dick Tracy watch. I can't use this in presentations for people under 30. They have no clue as to who Dick Tracy is. They don't even know who the Jetsons are. I mean, how depressing is this, OK? We've got air taxis. We've got the Star Wars ca cantina where you put something in your ear and it translates 40 different languages. We'll use our eyes now for security to clear TSA, to turn on our car. We'll look in the rearview mirror. The robots are coming. We've got robot pizza makers that are worth billions of dollars, robots that are going to deliver pizzas, OK? You've got Walmart using autonomous vans. All of this is of a piece. And the message is really simple. What worked in the past is not going to work. And part two, equally important, it's not going to be a smooth ride. It's not going to be a little bit different. You don't sort of grow into the future. And so whole sort of lines of business are disappearing. Trucking is really in trouble. Three million truckers. Now, some of these guys need to get out of the cab. There's no question that some of these guys, but, but we've got, look, we've got Uber Freight. We've got Tesla with cars that have enormous ranges. We've got new electric trucks. And then we've got Amazon introducing stores without cashiers. And by the way, there are more cashiers in this country than teachers. And Google has got things on your phone now that you can look at any object, a billion images, and it'll take you to a shopping link immediately, just through your phone. So you look at something, and there it is. Pretty amazing. These bots are coming. These are little lines of code, and they're frightening, because a few lines of code replaces hundreds and hundreds of jobs. JP Morgan Chase is one of the leaders. They just introduced smart contracts. Now, these contracts have eliminated hundreds of thousands of hours where lawyers charging enormous amounts of money to pretend that they're looking at $800 you know, dollars an hour pages that's the same page for the last 47 versions of the contract. So smart contracts are eliminating that. Facial recognition, very, very significant. The machines are better than we are at facial recognition. Now, if you think it's easy to do facial recognition, let me tell you that the difference between the mutt and the muffin is not clear. It's not obvious. And now some of you are gluten-free, so here's the gluten-free version of this, OK? I want to be respectful of all kinds of dietary requirements. All right, now, so what's really the message? Well, look, if you have a job that I can reduce to a set of rules and instructions, if I'm rewarding you for doing the same thing over and over again, those are going away. Those are going away, whether it's reading x-rays, whether it's uh, the oil and gas industry. You know, when the oil prices crashed, hundreds of thousands of jobs were lost, about 400,000 jobs, and, and lots and lots of rigs were closed. The rigs have come back, but the jobs haven't come back. And that's because it takes four or five people, not 50 people, to run a rig now. We've got robots for security. We've got robots for inventory. We've got robots in the warehouses. And warehousing is just the sort of the candle in the coal mine in terms of what's happening with robotics. Chinese buying hundreds of thousands of these things. But so is Amazon and everyone else. And again, if you look at the buckets of employment, today, if we're managing other people, if we're using some expertise, we're OK for a while. If we're 
dealing with customers and, and working with unpredictable physical responsibilities, okay. But if we're doing this stuff that over and over again is repetitive and redundant, those jobs are gone. And it's not limited to the jobs you would expect. It's not simply the things that are like somebody shoveling something or moving something. We can do eye checks, ear checks. We can do financial advising. This is a huge shift that's coming. We're talking about trillions of dollars. And the main driver is speed. The main driver is this idea that everything is accelerating in our lives and that speed is more important in some respects especially in the digital world than anything else. And we call this autocatalytic. And what that means is that every time there's a change, the next change is faster and comes about more quickly. And so this is not a question of velocity. It's a question of acceleration. It's not simply how fast is your business going today. It's how fast are you getting faster and how much are you improving. And if the rate of the competition is faster, then you're going to be left behind. And this is an interesting observation. I tell this to my grandkids all the time, which is that today, the rate of change in our lives is the slowest that it's going to be for our entire life going forward. So we have to think about technology in a new way. We have to say basically, not simply, how can I do what I've been doing better and more efficiently? Certainly, that's half the question. But the other half of the question is, how can I do things today that I never imagined were even possible before? So let's talk about just a quick example, 3D printing. So 3D printing today is sort of a joke. Most affluent communities have shamed either the schools or the libraries into buying these machines. Kids are melting a lot of expensive plastic. It's not really clear what's going on. Most fabricated object, still Yoda, OK? <laughs> but, but. 30% of the plastic parts that are shipped to a car dealer each week cost more to ship the part than the part costs. So where are we headed? Well, this technology is magic. We can create structures that are cheaper than steel, lighter than steel, but stronger as well. And that's just the beginning. They can be flexible. They can be fluid. So when you're sitting down and looking at the world and saying, where are these new kinds of disruptions coming from? Where do you look for trouble? You know, we don't try to tell the people in a given industry what to expect. What we try to do is alert them to the peripheries, to what's adjacent to what's going on. So we say Tesla is basically a, not a car with a few chips, but a computer on wheels, and that Uber is not a taxi company, it's a different solution. And again, you tell me an industry that's free of this kind of risk, and I'll give you $37 or a cup of Starbucks coffee. Because as it turns out, Starbucks is one of the largest banks in America. Pretty amazing, right? The deposits on the Starbucks cards have made it into one of the largest financial organizations in the country. And that's just the beginning. People will tell you they're perfectly happy to have Amazon be their bank. Wells Fargo is closing branches right and left, all these companies moving to digital. Why? The shortest hand expression that we could come up with is this, usership rather than ownership. All about utility, not about possession. So look at the list of companies that have nothing, that have squat, okay? They don't have capital investments, OK? They just provide killer services with ridiculously wonderful margins. And that list is only going to grow. So when we look at industries, we say, here's our analysis chart. And we say, how can you do better in the space that you're in across these dimensions, these vectors of competition? And if you can do better, then you're going to be around. And if you can't, then you're screwed. And part two of that is that there are hundreds and hundreds of startups, and all day long they're just saying, well, I can do it faster than these guys can. I can create a more accessible or an easier product. So in addition to doing an audit of your business or your investments and the businesses you're invested in, you have to go to the next step. And you have to say, OK, I understand what they do. Now, what do they do that's special or different? 
Because if you don't have an edge, you're just a commodity, and commodities are also going away. So is your edge customers? Is it distribution? Could it be expertise or scale? And trying to be all things to all people is a bad bet. And then the last thing, again, is this sense of urgency. You got to do it now before somebody does it to you. And I always say <clears throat> that if there's one person who should be sort of entitled to rest on his laurels with 2.7 billion customers, it would be this guy. And what does he say? <clears throat> he says, if I don't change Facebook, if I don't double down on Instagram and WhatsApp and all the other things I'm doing, then there won't be a Facebook much longer. All right. So if we look at what's going on out there, we've identified some trends, some drivers, we call them, that are a part of every one of your lives. And this won't come as anything in the way of news, but it's important to start to think about how these impact the businesses and the industries and our lives. So one is time. We have businesses that are completely and totally focused on time in every respect. They're part of the on-demand economy. These folks provide delivered services to students within five minutes. These people provide customer support in three and a half minutes. This is a ridiculously ugly machine, but it downloads a full-length movie to your laptop at the airport in one to three minutes. Only Amazon would say one to three minutes, that's pretty slow. They're shipping you shit that you haven't bought yet. Okay, now, how, how do they do that? All right, well, they look at wish lists, they look at prior orders, a lot of different things. But the real focus is what we call cursor hover time. And what is that? Well, cursor hover time is digital drooling because while you're looking into the computer, they're looking out and they're changing the pricing and offering you a bundle and coupons and incentives, and then they'll deliver it to you in minutes. So they get this time thing. So number one is time. Number two is messaging. Completely blowing up our lives, okay? Email is over. You know, email, we don't open, we don't read, we're drowning in it. Messaging, three attributes. <clears throat> it's intimate, it's immediate, and it completely interrupts whatever else we're doing. It's always there, it's always on. And basically, it's impossible to ignore. And so new businesses are growing up that have figured this out. And they've figured out how to market at scale using text. The next train is voice. And voice is going to change everything. Voice is four times faster than text. And of course, text is faster than email, and email is faster than whatever. So audio is coming. The idea of Alexa is becoming everywhere now. There are competitors to Alexa, they're late. And if you want a test of how late they are, Facebook has a new portal. You've seen it, it's sort of bizarre. Facebook with all the issues they have is like, why don't you buy this expensive machine so I can scan everything that's going on in your living room? But, <clears throat> but it has Alexa built in. So they've already given up the ghost. They've already said, leave it to Amazon, all right? So Alexa, it estimated about 128 million households by 2020. Alexa presence increases Amazon spend. And why is voice so important? You know this, because when you do a Google search, you get back on average 10 million results. Good, I'll spend the rest of my life looking through those. What do we want? We want an answer, one answer. We don't really want more choices. Okay, we suffer from decision fatigue all the time. You give me three choices, I'll buy something. You give me five to 10 choices, I'm gone. Because we're in a hurry. It's the right now economy. Nobody wants to wait for anything. We've got these devices, our phones, they give us information. They let us have packages and products talk to us. We can order our groceries at the train station or the bus stop. We can be at a football game and we can say, I want to buy that now. I don't want to wait in any lines. For the Philadelphia 76ers, we built this thing. You look at the back of the guy's jersey, up highs, pops a buy button. You press the button. We'll have the thing at your home before you get out of the parking lot at the end of the game, OK? What is, what's the message? You got to be there when the buyer is ready to buy. We all know this, OK? In the flu season, you know, takes my internist about two months of me begging to get an appointment for a flu shot. Three hours there, three hours back, a couple hundred bucks. Walk into Walgreens or CVS on my schedule, my time, five minutes, basically free. 
So what's going on? Well, urgent care is exploding. We're seeing more and more of these things. It's going to kill the hospital business. These inexpensive things that they charged a fortune for were really the profit centers in a lot of these hospitals. So we as customers, we as humans, have a very basic behavior. And that is that everything that was great yesterday is just so what today. This is just the nature of how it goes. So the bar keeps rising. And as I said, nobody wants to wait for anything. We really thought that the internet was going to turn us into couch potatoes. And it hasn't happened because we're happy to go get this stuff. Half of what we buy now, we go and collect. Walmart has figured this out. They're enabling pickup rather than delivery. And, and by the way, when it works, it's amazing, and the market rewards it right away. And so you're going to see more drive-throughs and more on-site ordering and more uh, curbside things. You'll pull up to a mall, and you won't get out of the car. There'll be a little kiosk there. Or you'll go into a store, and there'll be lockers that you open with your phone, and the stuff will be waiting for you there. Half of you know Best Buy's online purchases are now picked up in store. Now again, just when you think, OK, that's pretty cool. Let's catch our breath. Amazon comes along with something new. This is the dash button. The dash button goes on your washing machine. It costs a dollar. The first time you press the dash button, you get the dollar back. And oh, by the way, a container of Tide to replace the one you just finished pouring into your machine appears on your doorstep in about an hour. 200 manufacturers already using the dash button. In most cases, it's obvious where to put the button. In some cases, it's more confusing. <laughs> It's more confusing, but the idea is the same, okay? It's all about convenience and choice and taste. It's changing a lot. So when we say, how do you measure how a business is doing today, we have a new metric. You've heard about net promoter score, customer satisfaction, all those things, great. We call it the customer effort score. And this is how we live our lives. How easy is it to do business with your business? How many calls do I have to make? What do I have to do? You may have seen this ad that we made for Liberty Mutual. So we have a business that basically lets you settle an auto collision claim using your phone. You don't have to have wait for an adjuster. You don't have to do any of this stuff. Liberty is one of our clients. This woman is enjoying her time while her loss is being handled because she took a few pictures of it with her phone and she's got her kids and they're out seeing the Statue of Liberty. This woman is at some body shop trying to get her kids from being killed, okay, because she didn't use the phone app. So the message is how can I be friction free? How can I speed up the process to make it as painless as possible? Amazon better than no anybody. Amazon continues to expand. They're in these households. This prime service is just getting smarter and smarter. And oh, by the way, they're into everything. They're focusing now on liquor. They have basically uh, obtained distribution licenses in a lot of places. You know that they bought and are moving into healthcare now. And every time they announce a target industry, the market goes crazy. Not only in raising Amazon stock price, but in dumping completely on everybody else. And they never stop. So Amazon, for the longest time, about 50% of everything they do has been other people's products that they ship and fulfill for them. But here comes a new wave, private labels. 66 private labels now in Amazon. Another one is sampling. We'll send you two boxes. One will be filled with the stuff you ordered and some great samples. The other will be empty. Anything you don't want, put it in the box. We'll take it back from you. But the more you keep, the higher your discount is on the total package, OK? So you can see what's going to happen. As the box gets smarter and smarter, they won't even need to send it back. And then lastly, and maybe most important of all, is they are busting up the duopoly that Facebook and Google have owned in digital advertising. And they are doing it because they have magic. Okay? And the magic that they have is that they are different from Google in a number of respects. They know not simply who you are and where you are, but they know what you bought. And this is very significant. They also know how you paid. They know what you're looking for. So they're not guessing. 
And that's very material because it permits them to do a better job of fulfilling your requirements. They're not gonna say, as Google might, oh, I visited this shoe site, so when I go to my next place on the web, they'll show me a shoe ad. They don't know that I already bought the shoes. Amazon knows. So Amazon has all kinds of dynamic capabilities now for online, for digital advertising. And so you're gonna see in the next couple of basically years that they will not only catch up, but they'll probably move right by both Google and Facebook in terms of that marketplace. Now the next thing that's important to understand <clears throat> is that we want to do everything our way. And so the trick, and again, totally about technology, totally about data, is that we want to figure out how we can be, without diminishing the uniqueness and the quality of our products, we want to know how we can be all things to all people. And today you can do that, because today we have the capability of what we call mass customization, and that means that we don't have to make bad choices. It used to be I could be huge or I could be particular, and now we can be both. And so Facebook has a powerful tool that's called Lookalike. You basically go to Facebook and you say, here's 50 of my customers. Find me, out of your 2 billion people, find me 1,000 people that look just like the customers I have, because I'd like to sell them stuff too. And so that's what's going on, and it works so well that for about a dollar that you spend with them, it generates about $5 because that's exactly who you want to target. That's exactly who you want to market to. And why do they know this and how do they know this? Because if five of you right now went to the Amazon site <clears throat> on your phone or on the laptop, every single one of you would see a different front page times 350 million pages, and that's the database that they have. That's the amount of information they know, and that's how they have personalized and customized it, all driven by data. Now think about our world of technology, and here's what's happened. Okay? When the computers came along, the first thing they did for us was to help us manipulate information. When the web came along, basically it permitted us to be connected, and the phone came along, and the phone enabled the third wave, which was location. I could do anything I wanted to do anywhere I was. Now, what's the next generation? Where are we headed? Take a guess. The hint is in the question. We're headed to prediction. This is the future AI, machine learning. Everything is about getting ahead of the client, the consumer, the situation using data to predict because the flow of information is so massive now that we can't manage it without tools and without machines. We'll just drown in it. And so we can do simple things or we can do difficult things. Valentine's Day is coming up. This is 250,000 tweets. Now what this says is we track breakups on Twitter and it says if you screw up on Valentine's Day, you're in real trouble, okay? Now what is going on with spring break? Well, the college kids don't want to take their soon-to-be ex-girlfriend on spring break, so a lot of breakups there. Bad April Fool's jokes, okay? Mondays generally, unfortunate days. But all of this is just data, and what's happening is we're in a position now to take advertising and connect it to results. We know now what's going on with your credit cards. We can connect it to bricks and mortar. So honestly, companies that are doing traditional advertising are paying a penalty for being boring because they haven't engaged properly with the customers. They haven't made the connection. And marketing is even more wasteful. We don't even understand what marketing means in the data age, okay? Because the trick, <coughs> the trick, is to engage me, not aggravate me, not show me interruptive things and bad videos. And so we're moving from looking backwards to looking ahead and to where the puck is headed. And it's, it's amazing. And as I said before, Google is always looking backwards. And that's just half a loaf today. That's not going to get the job done. It's a little bit, I like to say, about getting a really great deal on a VCR, OK? Uh, and it's worse because 
the successes in the Google auction system basically end up charging you more and more. So it's really not a productive system. But this thing about prediction is coming on. Basically, information now from Google and the other data sources lets us be smarter than the real estate industry, lets us know things about your family that you didn't necessarily know. Uh, this poor guy's TiVo, you know, thought he was gay. He had to watch four football games and three army movies to break even, okay? <laughs> On the West Coast, you know, they can sell, they'll buy your house in three days based on data now. The credit card companies, always creepy, are projecting early divorces. How do they do that? Okay, same city hotel charges, flowers sent to a place that isn't your home. Singles bars, okay, exercise. Why do they do this? Well, they're perverts, but that's not, that's not why they do this. They do this because when people decide to get divorced, they immediately disown the credit card charges and they say, oh, those were all incurred by my soon-to-be ex-spouse. So they're building algorithms to change and limit behavior in real time. And this is just the start of this whole idea. You go into the supermarket now and we'll offer you two prices on yogurt the yogurt on the left has been here a little longer, but if you're gonna eat it tonight, you don't care. So you can pay half price. If you want it to last, you pay full price. And we're finding this is saving <clears throat> literally millions of dollars a week in wasted food because it's clearing inventory. And so that's one of these ideas. You've heard of surge pricing. We're gonna see more and more of this. Now understand, this is not a moral issue. This isn't like, gee, we're charging people more. The truth is some of us don't care. We don't care. We're interested in other drivers than whether it costs a buck or two more. And so if you can develop a system to ex extract premium revenue from some folks, it actually lets you grow your market because now you can subsidize the delivery of the products to more and more people. And who wouldn't want to do that? So what we're seeing is that the world is breaking into not the normal distribution, but a new kind of distribution. And this is very elitist, but that's how the world is, okay? When I say it's elitist, I mean we don't care by and large about traffic and about the millions of mopes, okay? We care about the engaged, highly valuable sector of the customers, and that's where we're gonna focus. You hear every single day that the newspaper business is dying. Here's a flash. The New York Times isn't dying. The digital advertising in the New York Times in the quarter just concluded for the first time in history exceeded the revenues from print advertising. Digital is great. They're smart consumers. And the Times is going really deep on that. They're at about $800 million in revenue from digital. And here's the message. The message is really clear. I don't want clickbait. I don't want a bunch of morons, okay? I want people that are engaged, there for a purpose, who value what they're getting, who want good information. That's where the world is headed. And so we call this sort of an interesting issue. You know, we thought that the internet was about connectivity and about getting closer to things. And it was, but it was really about measurement. It was really about the fact that now we can say basically two things. Every business will be judged by two simple words. It's really pretty interesting. What are the words? Transparency, which means it's a fair assumption that everyone will know what you're doing. Your customers, your clients, your competitors, your employees, everyone will know what you're doing. And in efficacy, they'll know how well you're doing it. And honestly, if you're not doing it as well as it can be done, they have choices today that are amazing. And they'll go elsewhere because they don't have the same kind of limits and restrictions that they used to have. And as a result of that, we have a new definition of loyalty and it's very scary to every established business and brand that's out there. And our definition of loyalty is this. I just haven't seen something better yet, okay? How frightening is that? Well, that's the way the world works today. Nobody owns the customer anymore. What you own is the moment, and believe me, you have to keep delivering. And if you deliver, you're in good shape. And if you fall behind or you take your customers for granted or you're not doing things that raise the bar, then you'll be toast. 
And you need to pay attention. Attention today is a spendable currency because as humans, we make time for what we're interested in and we don't have time for everything. We know that. This is another reference to my youth. This is Stretch Armstrong, okay? Well, completely wasted on probably anyone under 30. But the idea is today attention is something that we're competing for. It's noisy, it's cluttered, it's expensive, okay? And we're competing not just against competitive offerings of a certain product, we're competing for mind share, we're competing for slices of attention. And so again, if you look back at the world, when we started our economy, we were about creating goods and services. And then there came a time where we said, all right, the last decade or two, we'll create a new kind of product offering and service offerings, financial instruments. Today, the most valuable companies in the world deliver audiences. They sell mindshare. And frankly, if you're not getting paid, you're the product. You're being sold. Because attention is so scarce that they are engineering ways to connect. And when I say attention is so scarce, this is the new Tic Tac. And they were so concerned that mid-suck you would lose interest that it changes flavors. Okay? <laughs> This is a survey that Yale did comparing our attention spans to goldfish. It's been updated. The goldfish is doing fine. We're losing attention, OK? <laughs> Why? Because we're drowning. We're drowning. We're going more places and spending less time at all these places. So businesses need to new, newly create an idea around attention. They have to understand it's really important. They have to build a system and ownership for it. They have to figure out how do they get through the clutter, how do they reach the people that matter. And they have to measure it, and they have to understand that what you measure is what you do, and the rest of the stuff is just lip service. What you pay attention to is the way the world works today. That's how businesses can be evaluated and measured. And so we have to pay for attention. You have to offer me something, but the good news is it's not money. Okay? We pay for attention today in a transactional sense in one of a few ways. And here are the ways. If you want to test a business, if you want to determine whether someone is going to succeed in the economy going forward, there's no better test than this. Are you saving me time? Are you saving me money? Are you making me more productive? Time, when you're receptive and paying attention, Wherever you are and whenever you need it, what do you need, when do you need it, wherever you are without asking. This is only possible today because we live in a new world. We're connected. Now, the kids are hyper-connected. We know that. But I'll tell you that we did a survey recently. 80% of us look at our phone within 15 minutes of getting up in the morning. I think the other 20% are just lying sex of shit. I don't know what they're doing. They're, it's clear that they're lying to the survey people, okay? We look at our phone 163 times a day. Okay, that's about three and a half hours. And that's just the phone. The car is even worse. I love these manufacturers who say, please don't text when you drive. But here's four million other things going on on your dashboard just in case you weren't distracted enough, okay? Here's a doorbell service that when your home doorbell rings, it'll show you who's at the door, okay? You think Allstate doesn't love this? Okay? So each of us is using these things. We think of them as, as phones. They're tracking devices. They let us see you in the store now. We can see whether an end cap is working. We can see where aisles are concentrating traffic. We can see, are our windows pulling you in? How long are you staying? Are you a frequent visitor or customer? Amazing things. And then when we talk about things, it's the internet of things. This is the idea that going forward in our lives, everything will be connected. The smart home. Now here's a good example. In the home, for the longest time, the people who kept score about media consumption were A.C. Nielsen. Everybody knows Nielsen, Nielsen ratings. But Nielsen fell asleep, and they fell asleep because the little box that they put on top of our TV set got lost because in the average home today, we have eight and a half digital devices. They're all over the place. 
So who's the Nielsen of tomorrow? A company called Comscore, and what did they do? Well, they did a, a very clever thing. They took that little box and they moved it from the TV set to the router, and now it measures everything. It measures your phones, your tablets, your cable, your Nest thermostat, all that stuff. So they've got the goods now. Nielsen is still in the dark ages. I got a recent mailing, they gave me $2. But of course, the likelihood that I would return this address to household is less than zero. And of course, again, the market figures these things out and reacts. This is not rocket science. We're here in Disney World, Disneyland, Disney, another person figuring out IoT very much, okay? Your park access, your foods, everything. Uh, in fact, the personalized experiences are growing. Goofy will know, it's not Goofy really, it's a guy with a huge goofy head, but I don't wanna burst anybody's bubbles. Uh, but the idea is that they can measure everything that's going on. The goof, Goofy will know your kids' names, what city you're from. In the football world and in entertainment, we've got them on the trays of waitresses to track and make sure they're serving the right customers. In football, we had them on all the players in the Super Bowl. The coach no longer says that a player is tired. The computer says he ran that route more slowly, so he's out. In baseball, this guy is the most stolen on pitcher in baseball. He does some crazy wind-up dance. It's very disconcerting. So what did they do? Well, they measured the time it took him to do his dance. They added the time it takes him to eventually throw the ball to home plate. They added the time that it took the catcher to then throw the ball to second base. And they figured out that anybody not in a wheelchair can beat this guy from first to second. <laughs> So guess what, they're stealing them blind, all right? And, and it's everywhere, it's better running, it's better shoes that lace themselves, better tennis rackets, hydration, uh, how much you're consuming. These glasses work as a mouse. You remember Google Glass, we don't call that a device, we call it a prophylactic because who would have sex with this guy in a bar? But in any event, the idea is that these technologies are helping the blind to see. This glove translates sign language into speech. This lets you look through a wall. This watches your eyelids, and if they're fluttering, it'll vibrate the driver's seat. This is a rear view mirror. This is a fork that my wife loves. If you're eating too fast, it starts to vibrate, so it makes it hard to get the food in your mouth. I spent all day making that pot roast. You slow down and eat that thing. This is a spoon that offsets Parkinson's tremors, a belt that increases and if you've eaten too much, umbrella that says it's gonna rain today, pill bottles that talk to remind you of dosages. This is a different kind of pill in lieu of a colonoscopy, a little camera pill, we call it the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, <clears throat> these are smart garbage cans. They tell the truck every day whether to come, whether they're full or empty. So the routes are dynamically determined. You probably don't know this, but UPS trucks don't turn left. Now, why is that? Because they don't want to run into people, but also they don't want to waste time at the intersections. That saves 10 million gallons of fuel a year. A year. We've got a little thing, I, has anybody not moved? Okay, you've all moved. So you give your possessions to a bunch of guys with no teeth and you hope they show up at the other end. <laughs> This is a little box that has GPS tracking. You put it in with the load and it lets you know where the load is. So when the guy says he's stuck in a snow, you know, storm in Peacock or something and he's watching porn in Paducah, you know now. Anyway, a, a wallet, haptic signaling again, knows your budget. As the month goes by, it gets harder and harder to open the wallet, all right? So, <clears throat> so, the bot, and there's a husband version and a wife version. All right, so what's going on? Well, lots of everything and no time, no ability to deal with it, to make sense out of it. And what's the message? It's make it easy for me or I'm gonna go elsewhere. So I wanna thank you very much for your time. <clears throat> And just, just before I go, I want to take one more second. I want to tell you about ancient Rome. It fell, you know. 
Um, we think it fell because they didn't have cell phones. If they would have had cell phones, they would have known that there were the Mayan civilizations and the Han dynasties. They would have been much more robust. What does this have to do with anything? We have a company. They have a trademark on a word. What's the word? The word is selfie. Amazing. But what's most amazing in this world of accelerated speed, globalization, technology, selfie is the only word in the history of mankind. God didn't make it, love didn't make it, peace, war, only word in the history of mankind, same word in every language on earth. Because globalization was upon those cultures so quickly that they didn't have time to invent their own language for it. So 